We are now going to move from Mesoamerica into South America to talk about the Inca and their precursor civilizations. As you've previously read, the Chavin was the first major urban civilization in South America. The Chavin were the first to use metallurgy in the Americas, and metallurgy would then spread into Mesoamerica. Some of the other contributions that the Chavin made to the Americas was the domestication of llamas, um, a form of reciprocal labor obligation, which we'll discuss in more detail with other civilizations, and the importance of the jaguar and Andean and Mesoamerican religion. Remember, the Olmec also bring that to the Maya. On the map, you see where Chavin was and where their influence was. Basically, modern-day Peru. Prior to the rise of the Inca and after the fall of the Chavin, four civilizations will rise to power. The Moche and Chimu along the coast and the Wari and the Tiwanka in the Andean highlands. The Inca would adopt and adapt from these previous civilizations when creating their empire. Around 200 CE, the Moche civilization rose to power in the coastal region of modern-day Peru. The Moche did not establish a formal empire or create unified political structures. But evidence suggests that the Moche civilization was highly stratified and theocratic. The Moche used the Mita labor system that required members of Ayus or clans to contribute a set number of workers for specific tasks each year. The image you see on the screen is of a map, again, modern-day Peru, but also of moche pottery. This should look a little familiar because you guys saw pottery from the moche during our art activity. As the moche began to decline, the chimu began to develop along the coast of modern-day Peru. The chimu built their capital, Chan Chan, around 800 CE, and you can see it here on the map. Starting around 1200 CE, the Chimu began a period of aggressive military expansion. Ultimately, the Chimu would be conquered by the Inca in 1465, and the Inca would then borrow court customs from the Chimu. One of the court customs is this really elaborate jewelry, as you can see in the image here. Near Lake Titicaca in modern-day Bolivia, right here, this is Lake Titicaca to be exact, high in the Andes, we see the rise after 500 CE of the Tiwanku. Military conquests and the establishment of colonial populations provided the highland capital with dependable supplies of products from ecologically distinct zones. There's not a lot you can grow in the Andes or as high up as they were, so they had to be able to trade. It appears that some of the styles of monumental architecture used by the Tiwanku were later adapted by the Inca. We have here an uh, image of a sun gate done by Tiwanku, which if you go around Peru, you'll see is also really common in Inca architecture. See, This allows the sun to come in and hit a certain point in the temple during the equinox. The culture and technology of the Wari were clearly tied to Tiwanku, but the exact nature of the relationship between the two remains unclear. The Wari are in the purple on this map. The Wari were also a civilization focused on military conquest, and to that end, they built roads used to maintain communication with remote fortified dependencies. And you can see one of their roads here on the left. To feed the area that they controlled, the Wari used terrace fields, an innovation the Inca would later adapt. The Inca will inherit the political legacy of the Wari and the Tiwanku. The Inca lived in the Andes Mountains of Peru, and they developed an intricate and mighty civilization out of an inhospitable region. The Inca were relatively late comers to the Andean region. By 1200, when the Inca first developed into a unique culture, they were able to take influences from all these previous cultures. In little more than 100 years, the Inca developed a vast imperial state, which they called the Land of Four Corners. By 1525, the empire had a population 
of more than 6 million inhabitants. Historically, the first settlement of the Inca was Cusco, which means navel of the world, and was their capital. Cusco is here on the map. As you can see, the Inca expand fairly rapidly into all of modern-day Peru, Ecuador, and Chile. The Inca really rose to prominence under their ninth leader, Pachacuti, who reigned from 1438 to 1471. He led the Inca against their attacking enemies, the Chancas. After the defeat of the Chancas, Pachacuti reportedly had a vision that told him to use warfare to spread Inca culture and religion. Accordingly, Pachacuti sent out emissaries to preach the advantage of surrender, using the threat of conquest to take control of areas. To ease the assimilation of new peoples into the empire, the Inca adopted their gods into the Inca pantheon and allowed them to continue speaking their own languages, as long as they also learned Quechua. If these measures failed, Pachacuti used the threat of resettlement to keep his subjects under his control. Quechua is still the predominant language in modern-day Peru, even though Spanish is the official language, more Peruvians speak Quechua as their first language than Spanish, particularly in the Andes, the homeland of the Inca. One of their most important cities, Machu Picchu, was never discovered by the Spanish conquerors. In the time since its discovery in 1911, it has become the best-known Inca ruin. Just to clarify, while Machu Picchu was discovered in 1911 by Hiram Bingham, the locals of the Aguas Calientes area knew the city was there, and there is evidence of its continued use past the collapse of the Inca Empire. Those of you in my class should maybe recognize this picture, seeing as it's hanging in my room. One of the reasons Machu Picchu is so important is that it is one of the only cities in the Inca Empire to survive. When the Spanish came... They used the rocks and the stones to build their own cathedrals, and so we don't have that much. In fact, the last emperor of the Inca specifically led his men away from Machu Picchu, hoping the Spanish would follow and that they would never discover it. And he was successful. It remained preserved for hundreds of years. Inca society was strict and hierarchical. At the top was the Sapa Inca, the supreme authority of the empire. He ruled by divine right. He had the authority of the gods. And when he traveled around the empire, was carried around on a golden litter. No one in the empire was allowed to look him in the eye. That was considered a sign of extreme disrespect. As people in Peru will happily tell you, there was never a group of people called the Inca, even though historians use this term. Inca was reserved solely for the emperor. But for usage in this class, Inca is fine when referring to the civilization. The Sapa Inca's empress wife was called the Koya. She came from the ranks of the Sapa Inca's full sisters. And it was one of her sons who was always the legitimate heir of the empire. And in this image, the Sapa Inca is right here under the awning. The Koya's royal court of attendants were called the Aikuna, or the Chosen Women, who were chosen on the basis of beauty, skill, and social rank. The Chosen Women are here in the image. The Chosen Women were reserved only for the Koya, as well as for the Sapa Inca. They were not allowed to um, have relations with other people. In fact, there's a well-known story in Peru of a chosen woman who fell in love and decided to run away with this young man and they were caught. Not only did the Inca kill the chosen woman, he also killed the man, but also the entire family of the man to prove his point that nobody took what was his. Below Inca royalty were the Capac Incas the noble descendants of the legendary founder of the Inca dynasty. From this class of Inca came the four top-ranking governors, or Apus, who ruled each of the empire's quarters. Again, remember, the Inca called it the land of four quarters, or empire of four quarters. On this image, the Apus are 
here leading the four contingencies into this ceremony. Below this level of administrators were others, broken down by decimal levels to help deal with the execution of the Inca's wishes. At the low end of this decimal level were the Caracas, the successful leaders from groups in surrounding regions the Inca had conquered. Strict Inca law regulated lives of commoners. The state demanded that everyone work and designated jobs for every man, woman, and child to fill from the age of five on. Imperial officials oversaw where people lived, what they grew, and how they dressed. Commoners were also required to work in the Inca's fields and pay taxes, as well as work in state-run enterprises. The image you see on the screen is from a recreation of the Inti Raimi. And this is a religious ceremony that we'll talk about on the next screen. So these are actors playing the roles, but this is what it would have looked like many years ago. The royal family claimed descent from Inti, or the sun god. The primary religious festival of Inca was the Inti Raimi, the sun festival. It's held on the winter, or summer in the northern hemisphere, solstice. In fact, many of the Inca temples were designed specifically for the solstice. Remember back in Tiwanku how they had sun gates? Well, the Inca did the same. The major temple of the Inca was Coricancha, the Temple of the Sun in Cusco. The image you see on the screen is from Coricancha in Cusco. In this image, you see the two styles of architecture. From here on, this is Inca architecture, and it has lasted throughout the centuries. Now from here, you have Spanish architecture. The Spanish have had to continually rebuild, and we'll discuss why that is on a later slide. Now, the Inca made every effort to awe and intimidate visitors and residents alike with a nearly continuous series of rituals and feasts and sacrifices. And if you would like to see a recreation of one of their rituals, the Inti Raimi, go on to my website or Ms. Guayos under the World History Fun page, and you can see a video I took when I went to the Inti Raimi two summers ago. Another important aspect in the Incan religion is the chanca, which symbolizes the worlds the Inca believed existed, the animals that they represented, or the Andean trilogy, the three affirmations of the Inca, and the three rules of the Inca. The hole in the center symbolizes Cusco, the navel of the world. Now the worlds are the above world, the current world, and the below world. The condor represents the above world, the puma represents the current world, and the capital of Cusco is actually laid out in the representation of the puma. And the snake represents the underworld. Although unlike the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is nothing inherently evil about the snake. The affirmations the Inca lived by are I live, I love, and I work. And the three rules of the Inca empire are don't lie, don't steal, and don't be lazy. Honestly, not really bad rules to live by. Inca cultural achievement rests on the strong foundation of earlier Andean civilizations. Although the Inca did not introduce new technology, they did take previous technology and improve upon it. The development of effective agricultural techniques was the key to the Inca ability to create a vast empire. The Inca reshaped entire landscapes that were not easily suited to agriculture. They terraced mountainsides, straightened rivers, filling or draining marshes, and channeling water into the deserts to make them bloom, and all in an effort to meet the food needs of a growing empire. The Inca raised the construction of mountain terraces, or adens, to an art form. As you can see in this image, well, there are a lot of them because they encompass this whole part of the image. This is a valley that I saw when I was in Peru. Now these fields were sometimes fertilized with guano, bird droppings, imported from coastal areas. They irrigated the terraces through the use of ditches and canals which always flowed down the mountain so as to take advantage of gravity in the watering of their fields. The Inca raised corn, potatoes, and quinoa, a nourishing grain, among other produce. 
The Inca were so adept at building andens that in places such as Machu Picchu, their terraces could have entirely different agricultural output and different crops could be grown on them because they could drop 15 degrees in temperature between each terrace. It was pretty impressive. The Inca did not have a written language, yet they managed to keep important records using a substitute for writing known as quipu. It consisted of knotted strings of cotton or wool, dyed in many colors, and sometimes comprising hundreds of strands of varied lengths. The quipu maker was called quipu caimo, or keeper of the quipu, who recorded the number of llamas, quantities of corn, or number of days commoners worked for the government by tying different kinds of knots in different colored strings. Remember, we talked about the Mita system with the moche. Well, the Inca used that as well. The Mita is when commoners worked a certain amount of time for the Inca government. And this, again, is all recorded on the quipu. The strings were knotted using the decimal system. There was a position for a thousands knot, a hundreds position, etc. Now, if we get closer to this image, you can see all the varying knots on this Kipu. Again, this is how the Inca recorded, and for the most part, we really can't read it under the knowing it stands for some amount of numbers. Another advancement of the Inca was their architecture. It was relatively earthquake-proof, which is pretty impressive, seeing as we still have a bit of an issue creating earthquake-proof buildings now. The United States were good, other countries not so much. The Inca were highly skilled craftsmen. Their most important buildings were constructed of carefully cut stones fitted together without mortar. As you can see, this here is the line. You cannot fit anything between these stones, and there is no mortar there. That is how well cut the stones are. Their buildings were also built with a slight incline to allow them to survive an earthquake. Another way the Inca modified their architecture was to put smaller, more easily removable stones, like this here, between two larger stone walls, which in the case of an earthquake would be easy to fix, as opposed to fixing an entire stone wall. So when an earthquake happened, the large stones press in on the small stones, small stones break, you replace the small stones. That's why in Cori Concha, you still see so much of the Inca architecture, but the Spanish architecture is not there. The Spanish could not build earthquake-proof architecture. The Inca are also well known for their road system, and Inca laborers would ultimately construct 13,000 miles of roads in their empire. Some of these roads are still used today, most notably the Inca Trail, which is used to hike into Machu Picchu. This is part of the Inca Trail and one of the still existing Inca roads. As we talked about previously, the Inca Empire really rose to prominence under Pachacuti. Pachacuti's son, the Topa Inca Yupacani, who reigned from 1463 to 1493, took complete control after his father's retirement in 1471, and he expanded the empire to its ultimate boundaries. He used his diplomatic and administrative skills to win over province after province. He also moved the capital from Cusco to Quito. Quito is in modern-day Ecuador. Huayana Kampik, Yapakuni's son, was the next ruler. He preferred to live in the northern area of his empire and rule during the empire's highest point even as his family sowed the seas of its downfall. Huayna Capac had several sons, and the rivalry between two of these would be devastating. Huascar was the elder son and the legitimate heir to the throne. Atahualpa was a younger son, but he was the son of Huayna Capac's favorite wife, and thus he was raised to assume the throne. When Huayna Capac died, Huascar, supported by the priests, fought with Atahualpa, who was supported by the army. Six years later, Atahualpa would capture Huascar and declared himself High Inca. The image you see on the screen is of the Inca from the Inti Raimi. He is performing a ceremony on the side of Cori Concha as he gets ready for the Inti Raimi. And this is possibly what the Inca looked like when they were 
performing ceremonial roles. Before Atahualpa could heal the wounds of the Civil War, the empire would be attacked once again and ultimately would lead to its downfall. The Spanish would arrive in 1532 and Pizarro would help destroy, again, a really impressive empire. But once again, as with the Aztec, we will discuss them in the fourth six weeks.